take your Bibles if you got it. If not, follow along with me to the book of Galatians, okay? And as we turn to the book of Galatians, go ahead and get to chapter 6. And, and, and we're going to get there because the, the meaning behind this message is uh, you got to know who I am. I'm, a, I'm what you call an evangelist. Now, a lot of people don't know what an evangelist is. Here's what an evangelist basically is. I try to get as many people as humanly possible in one area that, that we can do. Now, you take that to what happened last year called the pandemic. In March of last year, we were in your city. I was here when the strip shut down. I was here when the Pac-12 basketball tournament was being shut down and people were getting on the bus and we thought, well, maybe for a couple of weeks, maybe for a month, we're going to have to kind of go into a different mode of ministry. Well, you take that to nine months later when I was still sitting on the couch twiddling my thumbs going, what in the world is happening? From the time I was a teenager, my entire life was traveling, sharing with groups of people, and that was taken away from me. And I had some time to think. I, I wasn't going to compete against the local church. It's something I've, I've preached against uh, for, for, for decades, is that Christ loved the church so much, he died for her. And at that point, the world didn't need to hear from an evangelist. The, pastor, the, the world needed to hear from shepherds, pastors, as they were trying to tend to their flock. So as I was put on the sideline, I, I was kind of like some of you. I was wondering what in the world is going to go on. And it made me start wondering, all right, what is this world going to look like post-pandemic? And the message I'm going to bring to you this morning is entitled, A Post-Pandemic Follower of Jesus Christ. What is it going to look like when we are the post-pandemic? pandemic follower of Christ. And so I went to Galatians chapter 6 because the book of Galatians was basically written out of a controversy. You know the story of the Apostle Paul. If you don't, Paul is the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. When he was born, his name was Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus didn't like the church. He wanted to persecute the church. He wanted to stomp out Christianity. And wherever he went, he was trying to cause, you know, a, a destruction of the church. He was going to a place called Damascus, and on the road to Damascus, something happened to him. He met Jesus. Now, I want you to, I want you to zone in on this, okay? He didn't meet someone who knew Jesus. He didn't get more information about Jesus. He met Jesus. And when he met Jesus, his old life was turned upside down. I mean, all of a sudden, to give evidence of the experience he had, you'll notice in the New Testament, he was no longer called Saul. He was being transformed to this man named Paul. And Paul became the missionary. Paul, wherever he went, he wanted to tell people about Jesus. And he was in a place called Galatia. And, and the word of the Lord was received so warmly. People started receiving Christ. The church was birthed. Things were happening. So you know what? Paul, as a missionary, after that season, continued on in his journey. Well, as soon as he left, there was this other group that kind of started coming in, and, and they were called the Judaizers. Now, all you need to know about the Judaizers are, are the Judaizers said, Paul, he was almost correct. You know, that, that, that group that's out there going, well, you know, really, let me tell you something really secret, okay? Be weary of anyone who has a secret, okay? So these Judaizers came in, and they said, Paul was almost correct. You got to have Jesus, but you also have to add on to that this in order to find a right relationship with God. Now, it, it, to, in order to just go ahead and tell you the context, what they're talking about is a ritual called circumcision. So, so Paul is out in his missionary journey, and he starts getting wind and word that the Judaizers are in Galatia, and they're saying not only do you have to have Jesus, but you have to go through this ritual. And Paul, all of a sudden, he started writing the book of Galatians. In fact, if you were to study the book of Galatians, you would find that it's one of the few books that Paul actually wrote in his own handwriting. 
He didn't dictate it to someone else. He pinned it himself because he was so, um, um, I, I don't want to use the term upset because he wasn't, he was vexed, okay? I'm going to use a biblical term. He was vexed. That means he was ticked, okay? So he's writing the book of Galatians as a, literally of saying, hey, you don't add anything to Jesus. It is Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. So when he gets to the end of Galatians chapter 6 in verse 17, I, I, I want you to put this, the, this, screen, the, the, this verse into your mind. Listen to what he says. In verse 17, he says, From now on, let no one cause me trouble. Ba basically, he is saying, from now on, case closed. From now on, I've already refuted everything that's out there about this controversy. And then he says this phrase, for I bear on my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Now, I want you to look at that word marks because in the original language, it is the word stigmata. Now, in, in Paul's day, it would be... Um, it would be something more than just um, a, a, a tattoo. If I were to give you a reference, it would be like if we were to have a uniformed soldier and, and, those, and, the, and the chevron stripes on their sleeves. Uh, but, but it's even much more than that. When Paul says, I bear in my body the stigmata, what, what he is basically referring to is in the, in, in the, in, in the South, a cattle farmer, where they brand their calves. That is, that is what Paul is saying. Is he's saying, I have been branded. My body has got the brand of Jesus. And so I started thinking, what are the brand? What are the marks? What are, the, what, what are going to be the things that are going to be marked in our life when we are a post-pandemic follower of Jesus Christ? And so if you don't mind, keep your Bible open or walk with me through the screens. And we're going to go through Galatians chapter 6. And I'm going to give you four marks of a post-pandemic follower of Christ, okay? The first thing we're going to do is go up to verse 1 of Galatians chapter 6. And this this is what Paul says. He says, in, in, in verse 6, he says, brothers, now that's implied sisters. It is not just an exclusivity there. He's basically going like, hey guys, okay? So understand, he is saying to everybody, he is saying, if anyone is caught in any transgression, if anyone's caught doing something that's not wrong, this is what he says, you who are spiritual should restore him. Now, if you've got a pen or a pencil and you're taking notes or you have your Bible out, I want you to underline that word spiritual, okay? Look at the person beside you and say spiritual. All right. Now, the reason why I'm doing that is because I want you to see the first mark. The first mark of a post-pandemic follower of Christ is that of being a spiritual person. Now, when we talk about being spiritual in, in Vegas... And I understand 96% of the city is unchurched and everybody's out there going, what in the world do you mean by that term spiritual? When you say spiritual, what does that mean? Is that Dr. Oz? Is that Ellen? Is that, is that Googled? What does that mean? Well, it's actually a scriptural term. In fact, do you know that every one of us in this room this morning, we're in one of three conditions before God. According to Scripture, every one of us here, we're in one of three conditions before God. Now, now the first condition is that of what Scripture calls the natural man, the natural woman. Now, that's basically how we come into this planet. We come into this world as a natural person. We're birthed from our mother's womb, coming in as a natural person. You know what that means? That means we're birthed into a fallen creation. You see, just like last night, I shared that we all have one thing in common. You may not know me, I may not know you. I live in Alabama, you live in Las Vegas, but we have one thing in common, we've all sinned. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In fact, if you don't believe me, let me ask you a question. If you've ever told a lie, not just this morning, 
It's early, okay? But if you've ever told a lie in your entire life, would you just raise your hand right now? Just raise, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. I want you to look around the room right now. Look around the room, look around the room. Do you see all the hands of the liars that came to church this morning, okay? Do, do you see that? I, I say that for two reasons. One, for you to realize you're not in this by yourself. To realize that you're the only one in this room who's done something. We've all blown it. We've all messed up. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How does that take place? I mean, how, how is that a possible? You have to go back to the Garden of Eden. And you know the story of the Garden of Eden when uh, the woman, Eve, was deceived. But Adam deliberately disobeyed. And from that moment, sin has flown through the veins of every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. We're sinners before a holy God. You see, that, that's the reason when everybody's out there and they're going, man, why can't I fill up this loneliness? Why can't I fill up this void? There was a philosopher, philosopher that said, in the heart of every human, there is a vacuum-shaped place that only the love of God can fill. You know why that is? Because when you were birthed onto this planet, because of our sin nature, we are separated from God. I cannot come into his presence. Why? Because I'm a sinner. You can't come into his presence because you're a sinner. We've already raised our hands. And, and, but here's the good news on a Sunday morning. When we couldn't come to him, he came to us. Jesus was birthed on this planet. And for 33 years, he walked among us. And he never once says, pay me. He doesn't even say, thank me. He says, follow me. Why? Because he knew his mission on this planet. He went to the cross for your sin and for my sin. And apart from Christ, the Bible says, those who are birthed on this planet are in a natural condition. I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm not saying you're an immoral person. I, I, I'm not not even saying you're not trying to be a religious person. I'm saying according to scripture, you're in a natural condition because you're apart from a living God. So the second condition Paul, uh, scripture says that we could be in is not only a natural condition, but Paul mentions this in the book of Romans. He says the carnal man, the carnal woman. Now that's one of those terms that we could spend all day deciphering. But let me just kind of put it to you like this. In America, in 2021, you know, the carnal man, the carnal woman is the person who would say, I know Jesus, but then they live like they really don't. With their, with, Jesus says it like this, with your lips, they praise me, but their hearts are far away. It's kind of like one of those, uh, have you ever watched an international movie that's kind of been dubbed in English? It's not, it's to me, I, I'm too ADD. I can't even conceive that because the lips are moving and it's not, it's not synced up. I, I mean, the audio, here's this. The audio is not matching the video. To, to me, that's what I think of, of a carnal person. Their audio is not matching their video. So, so you got the natural condition, you got the carnal condition, and then I look in verse 1 of Galatians chapter 6, and I see Paul saying, you who are spiritual. The only other condition to be before God is spiritual. And I'll be honest with you, that scares some of us to death. Because if you looked at me and said, are you a spiritual person? I go, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? So let's look at it through the lens of Scripture. Do you know who is the spiritual person? It's the man, the woman, the student who's here this morning, and you know Jesus personally. Now, you could be sitting there going, wait a minute, I'm not perfect. I got that. Can I go ahead and tell you? There, there's, there's, no, there's no one perfect. We've already decided that we've already done something wrong. But those of us who know Jesus, we're in a relationship with him, and here's the good news. When Jesus came into my life, you know what he does? He does. He presents me pure and blameless before God the Father. I'm going to tell you something this morning. If you know Jesus, you are perfect in your Father's eyes. Nothing you can do to destroy that relationship. You can hinder the fellowship, but you cannot destroy that relationship. He loves you. He adores you. He loves us so much he'd rather die than to live without us. That's how much he loves us. So in that relationship, those of us who are spiritual are those of us in this room who know Jesus. 
We're on the road to perfection. We're not like we were yesterday. We're not like we're going to be tomorrow. But as he is growing inside of us, man, all of a sudden I am being molded into the image of Christ. Now, I know you may be sitting here going, Scott, how, you, I hope I hadn't confused you. But if you're sitting here going, how do I know if I'm natural? How do I know if I'm carnal? How do I know if I want to be this spiritual person? Here's the question. Has Jesus changed your life? Because there is a, um, during the pandemic, I picked up on this, on this proverb. It's a Russian, pro and I know we shouldn't talk about Russia too much right now, but they're, they're probably listening to me right now. Hello. All right. But anyway, all right. So here, here's, the, here, here's the deal. I picked up on this Russian proverb. And it's about a hundred years of age. I'm, I'm going to ask him to put it up on the screen. Listen to this Russian proverb. Those who have been infected with the disease of Jesus will never be cured. You don't meet him and get over it. He changes your life. You, you, you see, before this stuff, and everybody's talk, talking about the vaccine. Okay, Everybody's talking about the vaccine. I'm going to go a different route because vaccines have been around. And if you've ever gone on a mission trip and gone into certain parts of the world, you've got to have some vaccines. Now, you don't have to, but <laughs> what they told me I could catch, I was going to get the vaccine. Okay, I'm just telling you what they told me. So I, I was in the doctor's office and he, he, was, um, he was about to give me a shot. And, um, and I stopped him. I, I wish I could tell you this was planned, but it was right off the cuff. I looked at him and I said, hey, Bert, he's my doctor. I said, what, what are you about to do to me? And I'll never forget what he did. He stopped like deadpan. And he just kind of tilted his head back and he started chuckling. And he said, well, I hate to tell you this, but I'm about to give you the disease. But he said, don't worry. I'm just going to give you enough to where your body can build a defense against it. And you'll never become infected. And all of a sudden, I've started putting all this stuff together. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, you know what's the problem? America is a very religious, pluralistic society. And if you're not careful, people will not become infected with Jesus. They'll just get enough of Jesus into their system where they'll become vaccinated against him. Where they can, they can hear the sermons, they can listen to the, to the worship because, hey, these folks are talented, amen? They can even, amen, that's right, we'll honor those, yes. And you can, even, you can even listen to a message, as long as it's not too long and there's a couple of jokes, amen? Okay, anyway, but you can do all that, but walk out of here not being infected, why? Because you just got enough of him where you can just go through the motions. The post-pandemic follower of Jesus is not going to be vaccinated against him. We're going to be infected with him. Where there is no other option. There is no other route. There is not, I'm going to try Jesus out and then try something else. Nope, once you find Jesus, I got news for you. You found it all, amen? So the first mark of being a post-pandemic follower is that of being spiritual. Don't ever be afraid of that word spiritual before. And I'm going to say something else to you just to kind of, kind of uh, help you. Don't let them start hijacking biblical words for their terminology. Let's define the term for them. What is spiritual? Go to God's word. It is a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay? So just like, you know what I had to do when I got up here? I had to walk up these steps. What I hope you'll see is Paul is laying out this case that as we're going to be a post-pandemic follower of Christ, there are going to be steps to this. The fundamental, foundational step is to know Jesus. That's the mark of spirituality, being spiritual. The second mark builds on this, and that's the mark of humility, okay? Now, when we talk about the mark of humility, it's right there as Paul is writing. Not only do you find verse 1, go down to verse 3. Listen to what Paul says here. He says, uh, for if anyone thinks him that he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So the first mark is being spiritual. The second mark is that of humility. It, it, to understand that, that for by grace am I saved through faith. It, it, it's, not my, it's nothing I can do. I can't boast and brag about it. It's the work of Jesus. I did nothing 
did nothing for my salvation. Therefore, I, I have to trust Christ. And as, here's what John the Baptist said in John 3.30. He said, he must increase and I must decrease. And I, I, I got, it's that word called pride. Can I just tell you something? Pride, pride is one of those sins that God detests. In fact, we've, we, maybe you've heard this. In the South, it's kind of all over our culture. There's a phrase that said, pride comes before a fall. You've heard it too. Okay. Now, you know where you get that? Right in the margin of your Bible, this verse, Proverbs 16, 18. That's where it comes from. Let me tell you what the proverb says. A haughty spirit comes before a fall. A haughty spirit is, is different. A haughty, it's, it's a form of, of arrogance or, or pride, but, but, but it's more of just like an, un, an unrealistic view of yourself where you have, to be, you have to be brought back into reality. Now, I'll be straight up with you. We've all been there. Every one of us have had a haughty spirit. I'll be the first to raise my hands. Man, a haughty spirit comes before a fall where you need to be brought back into reality. Um, there's a story about Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, the greatest boxer to have ever lived. When after the thrilla in Manila, it says that he got on the plane, he had the championship belt around his waist, and he was parading it around. The stewardess came up and said, sir, please take your seat, put your seat belt on, we're about to take off. To which Muhammad Ali kind of quipped, Superman doesn't need a seat belt. To which the stewardess replied, Superman doesn't need an airplane, okay? Sit down, put your seatbelt on, we're about to take off, okay? So, so I, that is one of those brought back into reality moments. You're not Superman because Superman doesn't need a plane. All of us have been there. Now, that's a haughty spirit. Here's what Scripture says. Pride comes before destruction. And I, and I got news for you. There's, there's two forms of pride. There's arrogance. Can I just tell you, arrogance is that where you see it walking into the room. We've all been there, okay, where we go, wow, there's not enough room for two of us in this room. All right, now arrogance is one of those that's easily condemned. We, we, we look at it quickly. But I'm, if you're a part of the church, if you're part of the body of Christ, can I tell you what I battle against? is not the first form of pride, arrogance. It is the other form of pride that is just as deadly and sometimes so subtle you can't even see it coming. It's not arrogance. It's false humility. It, it is when we've gotten to the point where we could write the book, I'm humble and proud of it. You know what I'm saying? All right. it, it's just when you got to the point where you, can, you, or you can start looking at all the phrases of church and bring all the attention to yourself. Man, the one thing that I was praying against even last night with all those decisions, I don't want anyone, anyone to walk out of there and talk about Scott Dawson. And somebody was asking me, who are you looking forward to? Are you looking forward to Crowder? Are you looking forward to Lecrae? Are you looking forward to Evan Crowder? I went, I'm looking forward to the invitation. I'm looking forward to when people come to meet Jesus. And when they walk out of there, I don't want them talking about an artist. I don't want them talking about a preacher. I want us talking about Jesus because he's the only one who can change your life. I, now, I'm going to bring the illustration home. Have y'all, y'all may have not seen this. There's a movie out called Courageous. Have y'all ever seen Courageous? Now, I am in that movie. Now, I know you're probably sitting there going, well, that's a very proud way of saying it. Well, just follow along with me, okay? I wasn't supposed to be in the movie. I was just there doing a Bible study for the team. And when I was about to leave and go back to Birmingham after the Bible study, the, the, the executive producer kind of hollered out, hey, Scott, do you want to be in the movie? And I acted just like every one of you. I went, yes, sir, I do. <laughs> yeah. A star is born, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, and so I knew it was going to be my, and it was the very critical moment. It was when all the police officers rushed in and, and, and they arrested the, the bad police officer. And they, they realized while they were taping it that a uniformed officer would never arrest another uniformed officer. So they had to have somebody fit in the suit to be the uh, internal affairs. And I was the only one who could fit in the suit. True story. So I was invited to the premiere at Fox Theater in Atlanta. I'd never been treated so nice in my life. We had an entire roll of my guests. And I knew when it was coming. I was telling everybody, hey, here it comes. Here, here it comes. And if you've seen the movie, you don't see me at all. 
All you see is the back of my head. I'm serious. All you see is the back of my head. I had a friend, my friend's name, Jordy. He was sitting down the road. He was bent, I, I, he was bent over, laughing uncontrollably at the most serious part of the movie. He looked down at me and he said, Scott, you're, not, you're nothing but a glorified extra in this movie. You're not in this movie. And the Lord used that. Hey, can I tell you what I learned? You know what my biggest problem is in life? It's not y'all, it's not them, it's not that. It's me. It's self. You know what I want to do? Sometimes I just want to photobomb Jesus. It's all about him, but sometimes I want to get in the picture and go, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I realize if we're going to be a post-pandemic follower of Christ, he's the leading man. And all I am in this thing called life is a glorified extra. He must increase. I must decrease. It's all about Jesus. You see, the first mark is going to be that of being spiritual. The second mark is going to be that of humility. Let me give you the third mark, and that's the mark of persistence. Now, when we talk about the mark of persistence, I'm going to jump up to Galatians chapter 6, verses 7, 8, and I want you to see verse 7 here because he, it is talking about the law of sowing and reaping. And listen to what Paul says. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that he shall also reap. Now he goes on, if you were to look at the next verse, he says, let me just read it to you. I didn't give him this verse, guys, it's my fault. He says, for he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. He's talking about the law of sowing and reaping. And then he gets below that. And I, I guess this is the verse I'm going to launch out on. Verse 9. Verse 9 says, And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap. And then he uses this last phrase. If we do not lose heart. I don't know who this is for this morning. I don't know if the Lord just kind of built it in my own life. Maybe I need it after this, uh, this past weekend. Don't give up. If there's, if there's one message I can give to you is don't give up. The post-pandemic follower of Christ is going to have that mark on our lives of being persistent. Paul says we shall reap if we do not lose heart. If there's anything we have walked through the last 14 months, it is the battle of losing the heart. It is the battle of just wanting to throw up our hands and saying, what's the use? Why should we do this? And if you're sitting here this morning going, Scott, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what's happened to me. Let me just kind of give you an insight. Don't look at Scott. I want you to look at who's writing this passage. This is the Apostle Paul. And to be honest with you, if anyone wanted to give up, I think it would have to be the Apostle Paul. I mean, all he wanted to do was tell people about Jesus. All he wanted to do was advance the kingdom of God. Certainly, that should be received warmly. No. Everywhere he went, people were trying to stop him. They were saying, Paul, if you don't be quiet about the gospel, we're going we're, we're gonna to beat you. And Paul says, okay, go ahead. You might as well just beat me. And they said, Paul, if you don't be quiet, we're going to stone you. And I, I'm, you know, I'm not... Talking about we rocked, okay? Anyway, and they said, Paul, if you don't be quiet, we're going to throw you in jail. And Paul says, if you do, throw me down there in Rome because there's a lot of prisoners down there and they need Jesus. And finally, somebody says, Paul, if you don't be quiet, we're going to kill you. And Paul says, would you? To live is Christ. To die is. To be absent from the body is to be present with. 
Paul says, you don't understand. I have now crossed this line. It is no longer about me. It is all about Jesus. And ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to be the post-pandemic followers of Jesus, it is time for our egos to be laid aside so the Logos, the Word, can go out because people are searching. People are hurting. People are wondering, where is their hope? Where is their purpose? Where can I find a community? Where can I discover purpose? Where can I I make a difference and it's not found in anything we can muster up. It's found in the power of Jesus Christ. The first mark is going to be the mark of spirituality, being spiritual. The second mark is going to be that of being humble. The third mark is going to be persistent. Don't give up. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your kids. Don't give up on your parents. Don't give up on your neighborhood. Don't give up on your city. Let's not give up on our country. Let's not give up on our world. Let's not lose heart because we're going to reap. We will reap. The fourth mark, this is a point of personal privilege. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you because it's my favorite verse of Scripture. It's Galatians 6, 14. It's the mark of passion. If we're going to be the post-pandemic follower of Christ, in Galatians 6, chapter 6, verse 14, listen to what he says. He says, but far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul says, if I'll talk to you about a lot of things, but if I'm going to brag on something, I'm going to brag on Jesus. Now, I come from the state of Alabama, okay? A lot of people in America don't even know Alabama's a state, okay? They just know we got one thing in Alabama. Y'all may know what it is. What is it? Roll Tide. War Eagle. I mean, we, some people play college football. In Alabama, we live college football. It dictates everything about us, and it blows my mind that grown men in the South will paint their bodies and show up at a stadium and lose their lungs for 22 men they've never met, done nothing for them, but they still give it everything they've got. I did some investigation. Do you know the first college football game was in 1869? The two teams, Princeton versus Rutgers. It is saying on Wikipedia, that's where you go to get all the information. Anyway, but I, I think this to be true. There were a hundred people at that football game. You know what I said? <laughs> if they played last fall, they'd probably had the same crowd. But anyway, that's a different story. But in Alabama, we have 70,000 people that will show up for a spring game. That's practice. A hundred plus thousand people pack these stadiums every single week because that's their passion. And you know what? I was giving college football fans probably a, a, a disjustice because college football, I'm just gonna be, it's the greatest sport ever created. It's a lousy God, but it's a great sport. But what if I were to talk about our passions? You see what I've learned about America, we're supposed to worship God and have hobbies. But what we've done is we worship our hobbies and we just have a God. That's not the New Testament. Paul says, if I'm going to brag about something, I'm going to brag about Jesus. Everywhere I go, whatever I do, if everyone else can talk about all their stuff, why can't I talk about the one who's changed my life? Man, I'm telling you, that, that'll mess you up. When you go out of here and you start sharing Jesus, I, man, I pray you'll have people just fall at your feet and say, what must I do to be saved? But you're going to be called every name in the book. We had students that had their, their, their doors shut in their face. And if you're ever concerned about witnessing for Jesus and being rejected, would you write down this verse of Scripture, 1 Peter 4.14. This is not in my notes, I'm sorry. You know, I don't have any notes, so I'm just sharing off the hill, okay? But 1 Peter 4.14 says these words. If you're rejected for the cause of Christ, 
you're blessed. For the spirit of the glory of God rests upon you. Some translations go on to say, on their part he's blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. So the next time you're talking about Jesus and someone cusses you out, just look at them and smile real big and they're going to say, what are you smiling about? And you're, I'm being blessed right now. I, I am being blessed because what you're doing is you're not rejecting me. You're rejecting Jesus. On my part, he is being glorified. On your part, you're blaspheming him. Better watch out. But anyway, but that's what we do. We share Jesus. I used to think you had to be old to make a difference. Now I am old. And I realized, you know what? Your entire life can make a difference. There's, there's a book out called 30,000 Days and Counting. Now, in this book, it's, a, it's about a guy that was turning a certain age, and he realized he counted up how many days he'd been on this planet. Have you ever thought about that? How many days have you been on this planet? And there's stories, little stories, about people who have made a difference. And there was one story that captivated me. There's a guy by the name of William Borden. And, and William Borden was a, was a young man who was part of a very wealthy family in America. They're, they were very wealthy. In fact, on, when he graduated high school, his parents gave him a trip around the world. My daughter graduated this past fall, I mean spring. We gave her a camera. But anyway, so this guy traveled around the world. It was on that traveling around the world that he met Jesus. And when he came back to, to where he lived, he went to Yale University. When he got to Yale University, he was a different guy. He'd been infected with Jesus. He started talking about Jesus. By the time he had graduated, over a thousand students were involved in Bible study at Yale University. Wouldn't that be incredible to see that at UNLV or wherever you go where a thousand students are involved in Bible study because of one guy named William Borden. When he graduated, his parents said, hey, name whatever you want in the title. The salary is yours. Everything we have is yours. He said, nope, God's called me to be a missionary. He wanted to get the gospel into the Middle Eastern culture. So he went to uh, Egypt. And while he was in Egypt learning the language, he developed a terminal illness. And he died. Now, I know some of you are sitting there going, well, that's not the story you want to end on. Well, follow along with me. He died right before his 24th birthday. They shipped all of his possessions home. His parents opened up the crate, and on top of the crate, there was his Bible. It was said that after he'd met Jesus, he was never to be separated from his Bible. Wherever people saw him, he always had his Bible. His parents opened it up, and on the inside front cover, there were three different life events. And he had two words to describe each event. The first event was when he met Jesus. He had out written beside it two words, no reserves. The second event was when he turned down the salary to go into missions. He had out beside it two words, no retreat. The third life event was when he was found to be terminally ill hit out beside it two words, and you can put it on the screen. No reserves, no retreat, no regret. That to me describes a post-pandemic follower of Jesus Christ. Four, four points that are easy to preach, hard to live out. But this world has discovered the show is over it's time for us to get real. Would you bow your heads with me right now? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I, I don't know what the Lord is uh, doing in your life. I don't know how, where we are in that spectrum of when, wh where you are in your journey, but I know this is the place where God's placed you. And if you are part of that three-week challenge, I'm praying that, I, I, that, that, hey, you come back for two more. It's gonna be really good. But right now, wherever you are, would you just kind of open your heart, receive what the Lord wants to do in your life, and just, just do one thing. Be obedient to Him. As your pastor is coming to the stage, Pastor Wes, I, I'm just going to lead us in a prayer. Father, today, you, you meet us right where our need begins and bring us to where we need to be. 
And I understand inside this room there are more concerns and situations than any human can, can ever comprehend, but you're aware of each one. So Father, I pray that you'll meet us where our need begins and bring us to where we need to be. I pray for the man, the woman here who's right now, they don't know you personally. Draw them to yourself. I pray for those of us who struggle with humility. I pray for those of us in this room that are struggling with the, with the, with the uh, possibility of just wanting to cash in and give up. Lord, I pray for that person in this room that's talking about any and every other thing except for the one who changed their life. Wake us up, straighten us up. Lord, may we all stand up for your cause and for your kingdom. Again, we thank you for a pastor like Pastor Hyden. Bless him, refresh him, anoint him for this next season of ministry. And throughout everything, we're gonna give you the praise, you the glory, and you the honor. Because quite frankly, you're the only one in this room who's worthy of it. And we pray our prayer in the name that is above every other name. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen.